This is John Campbell. Welcome to Economics 1723 Capital Markets, the module for Lecture 19 on forwards and swaps. So let me begin by introducing uh, forward contracts and distinguishing them from futures contracts. These are two very similar linear derivatives. Uh, we're going to discuss forwards, which are slightly simpler, and I'll discuss futures in class. Uh, forward and futures prices are almost identical, and for the purpose of this class we will treat them as identical. The difference has to do with payments that may need to be made uh, along the way during the life of the contract. Forward contracts make payments only at the end. Futures contracts make payments on a daily basis. All right, so focusing in on forward contracts, uh, what is a forward contract? It's an agreement to buy a security for a fixed price at a given future date. And you should recall when we discussed forward rates in the term structure of interest rates that we were discussing such an agreement uh, where it was a fixed income security. Uh, now we're going to consider general securities which we agree to buy in advance at a fixed price. So if the agreement's made at time zero and the future date is time one, then we write the forward price agreed at time zero as F0. The underlying security price, or spot price, is written S0 at time 0 and S1 at time 1. Now, under the terms of the forward contract, no money changes hands until time 1, and the payoff on a forward contract at that time is S1 minus F0, and that, of course, is linear in S1. So, in other words, you get a security worth S1, you pay F0 for it, so the payoff or profit is S1 minus F0. Now, how is F0 determined? We're going to begin by assuming that the underlying security pays no dividends. In that case, there are two ways to invest money today to get a unit of the underlying security at time one. You can, on the one hand, you can buy a share of the underlying security at time zero and hold it to time one, which costs S0 at time zero. Or you can achieve the same outcome using a forward contract you can enter a forward contract to buy a share of the underlying security at time 1. The forward price is F0, but that doesn't need to be paid until time 1, so if you set aside cash worth F0 divided by 1 plus RF today, that will compound, that will grow at the risk-free interest rate in your bank account and give you F0 at time 1, which is what you need to uh, pay on your forward contract. Now notice here that when I'm talking about interest rates, these are nominal interest rates because forward prices are nominal, they're not inflation adjusted. That means that RF is always going to be uh, greater than or equal to zero. Now those two strategies of buying the underlying security itself at time zero or buying it forward are equivalent at time one. They give you the same thing, which is a unit of the underlying security. So those two strategies must have the same price Otherwise, the law of one price would be violated and there would be an arbitrage opportunity. So we know then that S0 is equal to F0 or divided by 1 plus RF, or equivalently F0 is 1 plus RF times S0. This is called forward spot parity. Now, we need to think a little harder though. What if the underlying security pays a dividend D, and I'm going to assume that's known at time 0, but paid at time one to the owners of the security. Well, in this case, the strategy of actually buying the security at time zero gives you some extra cash uh, at time one. You get a payment of D at time one, and that has a present value of D over one plus RF. So now we have to have S zero, the cost of buying the security, equal to F zero over one plus RF plus D over one plus RF. In other words, if you are using a forward contract, you not only have to invest the discounted forward price, you also have to invest the discounted dividend in order to end up with um, the security plus dividend at time one. Now, if we rewrite this equation, we see that the forward price is one plus RF minus dividend yield times S zero. And this part here, interest rate minus dividend yield, is called the cost of carry. So the cost of carry means how expensive is it to own the underlying asset as opposed to using a forward contract. On the one hand, there's the risk-free interest rate, 
uh, which increases the cost of carry. On the other hand, there's the dividend yield, which lowers the cost of carry. Now, the difference between the forward price and the spot price is called the basis. And all the pricing equations we've looked at so far can be rewritten as saying the basis is the cost of carry times the spot price. And uh, but you might ask, how, how, are the, how is this relationship enforced? Well, the answer is arbitrage trades. Uh, for example, index arbitrage, when, it, when these derivatives are on stock market indexes, these arbitrage trades would normally ensure this equality. And we'll talk more about that in class. Now, let's think about what happens if we have a forward contract that applies over many periods. What if the forward contract is for a future date capital T rather than date 1? Well, then we're basically going to compound the, what, the, the gross cost of carry, the 1 plus cost of carry. We're going to compound that over t periods. And this compounded thing here is called the t period cost of carry. Um, now, that's the pricing at the initial date. Um, after the initial date, say, say at date little t, the forward contract can be priced by updating. Essentially, we would update the spot price to s little t, and we'd update the compounding of the cost of carry so that it's compounding over capital T minus little t periods. Uh, moving right along, what if the underlying security is costly to store? Now, this doesn't arise if you have financial assets, but it does if you have commodities. So think about a forward contract on oil. So suppose it costs C dollars to store a barrel of oil for one period, but the barrel pays no dividend. Then the uh, parity relationship will say that S plus the discounted cost of storage equals the discounted uh, forward price. Or rearranging, the forward price is 1 plus risk-free rate plus storage cost C divided by spot price the proportional um, storage price, all times the current spot price. In other words, storage increases the cost of carry. Storage costs increase the cost of carry, just as dividend yields reduce the cost of carry. Now, of course, there are some commodities that are so expensive to store that, they, in effect, they can't be stored. And the most important example here is electricity. And for commodities like that, forward spot parity simply breaks down altogether. Um, one final case to consider is, is if the underlying commodity is useful in production, if, if producers uh, like to have inventories of a commodity, for example, uh, let's say copper um, or, or other industrial metals. So that idea is sometimes captured or modeled using the concept of convenience yield, Y, which is a quasi-dividend. It's not a real financial dividend, but a sort of usefulness dividend, which is paid by a physical commodity when held in inventory. Now, that's just going to operate like a financial dividend. You'll have S plus C, the storage cost, minus the convenience yield, all discounted, equals F discounted. Or if we look at the cost of carry, the storage cost increases the cost of carry, and the convenience yield reduces it, just like a physical dividend. Now, of course, we don't directly observe convenience yield, so what people do in practice is infer what this convenience yield Y uh, would have to be. Uh, by looking at the above equation. All right, now that's uh, completed our discussion of forward price in relation to contemporaneous spot price. But we might also be interested in asking, how does the forward price relate to the expectation at time 0 of the spot price in the future? All right, this is sort of like the pure expectations hypothesis of the term structure. and we'll discuss three possibilities. The, the pure expectations hypothesis in this more general context is that the forward price equals the expected spot price. The so-called normal backwardation case is where uh, the forward price is less than the expected spot price. And uh, a technical um, derivatives commodity term contango is the case where uh, the forward price is above the expected spot price. Now, at maturity, of course, at time one, the forward price will converge to equal the spot price. As the, as the forward contract has a smaller and smaller maturity, its price must equal the, the spot price. Um, so the cases discussed above imply that the forward price on average in case one remains the same. It's uh, a random walk. In case two, it increases on average. And in case three, it decreases on average over time. 
Now, when does each of these cases apply? Well, to keep it simple, let's think about a security that's storable without cost and pays no dividends. This, of course, can be generalized. And recall forward spot parity for this case, F equals 1 plus RF times S. So, in case 1, F will equal the expectation of uh, the expectation of S1 only if uh, S1 is expected to grow at the risk-free interest rate. In other words, if, if uh, S1 on average is 1 plus RF times S0, or equivalently, if the expectation of S1 over S0, the growth rate of the spot price, is the gross risk-free interest rate. Well, that, of course, would mean that the underlying security doesn't have any risk premium in it. Its expected return is just the same as the risk-free interest rate. Now, we'll find that F is less than the expected future spot price only if the expected rate of growth of the spot price is greater than the risk-free rate. So that means normal backwardation applies if the underlying security has a positive risk premium. This is indeed the normal case, which is why we say normal backwardation. And finally, uh, F0 is bigger than the expected spot price only if the expected return on the underlying security is less than the risk-free interest rate. So we get contango in the case of a negative risk premium. All right, now we'll move to the second major topic for this module, which is swaps. So what is a swap? Uh, it, it's an agreement to exchange cash flows at one or more future dates. Normally, a swap is structured so that no money needs to change hands on the initial date, just as in a forward contract. Now, we're going to focus on interest rate swaps. These exchange fixed rate for floating rate payments. There are also currency swaps, which exchange dollar payments for payments denominated in a foreign currency. And there are many more exotic examples. So, what's an interest rate swap? Well, a typical interest rate swap will have a notional amount, which I'll write capital N, and a maturity, little m. So, the terms might be like this. At the end of each year, for little m years, the fixed rate payer pays n times the fixed rate, which is set by the swap agreement. That's y fixed. The floating rate payer will pay n times the treasury bill rate, the one-year treasury bill rate, Y1T, that prevailed at the start of that year. Note that the payment is made at the end of the year, but the rate was set at the start of the year. Now, you can use different short-term rates. Here I said treasury bill rate, but you could use the Fed funds rate, or most commonly LIBOR, the London Interbank Offer Rate. So here's a figure from Bodie Keenan and Marcus showing how this works. Um, here is a, a company A has issued debt at a fixed rate, a 7% coupon. Company B has issued uh, debt at a floating rate, LIBOR. And they actually want to exchange positions. So company B would like to have fixed pay make fixed payments, and company A would like to make floating payments. So they enter a swap with the assistance of a swap dealer, who's shown in the middle. Within the swap, company A is going to pay LIBOR, flowing in this direction. Company B is going to pay a fixed rate, which flows in this direction, and the swap dealer takes a cut, which in this example is 10 basis points. Hence, company B is paying 7.05% here, the swap dealer is paying 6.95% here. Now, let's talk about pricing. How is the rate, the Y fixed rate, determined, and how are swaps valued? So for simplicity, we will now ignore the spread charged by the swap dealer, and I want to make an important point here. Since the notional amount is the same on both sides of the swap, the swap value doesn't depend on whether the notional amount is exchanged at the end of the swap, because that would just be n for n, so it would cancel out. But in thinking about swap valuation, it's easier to, to think about if we imagine that the notional value is exchanged. With this assumption, the floating rate payer is actually selling a floating rate coupon bond and buying a fixed-rate coupon bond, while the fixed-rate payer is doing the opposite. Then finally, we figure out the rate Y fixed, which is such that the value of the two bonds uh, is equal. Why is that? Well, we don't want any money to change hands at the beginning, so if people are, in effect, exchanging bonds, they have to be exchanging bonds of equal value. So this gives us a way to proceed and figure out what this fixed rate must be. We're going to do it by calculating and equating the value of the two bonds. 
So let's go to the, the end, or almost the end. Consider the beginning of the year in which the swap expires. Well, the floating rate payer must pay n times 1 plus y1t at the end of the year. If we discount that obligation to the beginning of the year, it's worth n times 1 plus y1t divided by 1, 1 plus y1t, which is n today. Well, we can then work backwards, and in every year we find that the floating rate payer's obligation is worth n at the beginning of each year, including the initial date of the swap. In other words, the value of the floating rate bond is simply the notional n. And that's, that makes complete sense because the interest rate compensates exactly for the time value of money period by period, so the value of the bond is equal to its face value. Well, it must follow then that the value of the fixed rate bond is also equal to par or face value n. Now remember from our discussion of the term structure of interest rates that if you have a fixed coupon bond, its value is equal to par or face value if its coupon equals its yield. So the fixed rate must be what? Well, the yield on the m period coupon bond that trades at par. Whatever that bond is, uh, it's, it's, it's the yield or equivalently the coupon on a, a, an m period coupon bond that is trading at par. All right, now what is it all this for? You know, effectively the floating rate payer sells a floating rate coupon bond and buys a fixed rate coupon bond while the fixed rate payer is doing the opposite. And uh, to end this module, let's ask ourselves why do a swap instead of buying and selling bonds? And there are three main answers. The first is that it may reduce transactions costs to do a derivative transaction. The second is that there may be some market imperfections. Some companies may find it relatively cheap to borrow fixed uh, because fixed, fixed rate lenders like those companies, even if the companies would rather borrow floating. And then some companies may find themselves in the opposite position. And the third argument is that, there, that swaps allow a separation of credit risk and interest rate risk. A company that actually does issue floating rate debt um, if it issues short bonds and, and uh, keeps issuing them every period, that will become more expensive if a borrower's credit rating deteriorates. Uh, but this is not the case if the borrower borrows fixed and combines it with an interest rate swap. So that is a third reason why swaps may add value in the securities markets. Thank you.